recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. This is the Historian's Lounge series, episode 11. Yes, I know, 11 episodes. That is incredible. And in case you are watching this when it's finally uh, published, the computer didn't work, so this will be the first episode on my phone. But other than that, I am pleased to announce um, our guest for the month of November. So my guest today originates from Ireland and grew up outside of Philadelphia, pursuing a lifelong fascination with military history. He earned a master's degree in military and diplomatic history in 1994. Have been an instructor for nine years at Delaware County Community College. My guest now teaches courses for adult education programs. With an interest in such topics, such as warfare during the Middle Ages, the military history of Ireland, armed conflict in Latin America, and mechanized warfare, he has had over 100 of his articles and book reviews published in both commercial magazines and academic journals. Currently lives with his wife and three cats. Joining us today on the show for the very first time, Paul Vincent Walsh. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're more than welcome. Awesome, awesome. So, before we get into um, our discussion today, is there anything more you'd like to tell us about yourself? Um, no, that sums it up pretty well. I mean. You know, I, I have been fascinated with military history all my life, and um, it, military history, in a way, is, is, has acted like a, a doorway to other aspects of history, so that, uh, you know, my, uh, my interests are, are very broad. Uh, I, you know, I'm not exclusively... Uh, interest in military history because military history touches upon so many other subjects. Awesome, awesome. And since the topic is about military history, this topic for the November's episode is one that I don't think a lot of people know about, including myself. So mm -hmm. the topic that we'll be discussing today is the War of the Triple Alliance, otherwise known as the Paraguayan War. And that was a war uh, that took place in uh, Latin South America from 1864 to 1870. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Paul, for sending um, the articles over to help me get an idea of the war. And for those that don't know the Paraguayan War, what was the War of the Triple Alliance and why is it significant to military history as well as South American history? Well, um, it was a, um, a a terrible conflict that was contemporaneous with the U.S. Civil War, um, and it actually shares some uh, interesting parallels with the U.S. Civil War. Um, it was one of, if not the largest, uh, armed conflict fought in South America. Uh, it was on a scale that was uh, really unusual for South America because um, uh, South America tended to have a smaller population overall than North America, and um, it did not have the, as much wealth or industry. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, this war was fought by armies that numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, it uh, incorporated uh, just about all the modern technology that existed in the 1860s that were also used in the U.S. Civil War. Uh, it it uh, launched Brazil uh, into a great power strat, uh, status within Latin America. In other mm -hmm. words, um, Brazil uh, really becomes uh, a, a regional superpower uh, somewhat because of this war. It certainly shows the, uh, the ability of, of Brazil uh, to wage war on a very large scale. Uh, it helped end uh, slavery in Brazil, uh, not, not as soon as the Civil War ended slavery in the United States. It took 20 more years or, well, no, 15 more years or so uh, for slavery to end in Brazil. 
it, um, it contributed to the unification of Argentina, uh, which is another uh, major power in South America. Uh, it ruined Paraguay. Uh, it, it totally devastated the country in, in, to a degree that um, uh, it has rarely been equaled for, uh, for another country uh, you know, fighting a war. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very important part of the history because of these things of uh, South America and, of course, the belligerents that uh, participate in the conflict. And it's a shame that, um, like so much of uh, Latin American history, it's largely unknown outside of the region. Hmm. Fascinating. So let's actually talk about the war. Let's start from the beginning. So when I was reading those um, articles you sent me, a lot of the scholars say that the complexities of the beginning of the war are kind of muddled. Some agree that possibly um, Uruguay was tr uh, Paraguay was trying to reclaim the um, territories. So what was South America like pre-war uh, of the Triple Alliance? And actually, let's go further. What was Latin America like in the 1800s at this point in time? Well, um, independence was still a living memory. It, it took place in the 1820s for both the Spanish and the Portuguese colonies uh, that made up almost all of South America, Brazil being the Portuguese colony and almost the rest of South America being made up of Spanish colonies. And uh, a major contributing factor in this war and so many other wars in uh, Latin America was uh, problems with border disputes. Uh, the borders were not uh, well defined because, uh, first of all, uh, the continent had not really been well, had not been thoroughly settled. So oftentimes the borders were located in uh, very inaccessible uh, places uh, and the maps were not very, very accurate or they contradicted each other. Uh, and so there was a great deal of disputed territory, and that's certainly the case for um, Paraguay vis-a-vis -vis Argentina and Brazil. Um, so that was a bone of contention uh, mm. among those countries. It wasn't unusual. There, there are border disputes between um, Peru and Ecuador, uh, between, uh, uh, I'm sure, other countries that you think of. So. It was oh oh Chile and Argentina, it was simply not a not a uh, an unusual thing, and that still exists today. Incidentally, um, in the 1990s, I think uh, Peru and Ecuador fought the third of a series of border clashes over um, territory over territorial dispute. Uh, so this is something that uh, is still with us in Latin America. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, Latin America was starting, well, South America, uh, was starting to come into its own because, um, uh, with the industrial revolution in Europe and the United States, uh, there is a growing demand for raw materials and, uh, South America had a great many of these, uh, um, items to export which in turn meant that uh, the governments of these uh, nations um, were starting to see uh, money flow into their coffers. And, uh, and they were taking this money <clears throat> and they were using it to modernize their countries to one degree or another. <clears throat> Excuse me, railways were being built, uh, telegraph systems were being uh, introduced uh, and of course, steamships were now, you know, being used for travel. Uh, all these things, by the way, uh, uh, enabled these countries to be more unified, uh, which was another issue for these countries. Brazil, uh, Uruguay, Argentina, the three members of the Triple Alliance, all three of them uh, had a great deal of difficulty with uh, political instability uh, and um, portions of their countries uh, seeking independence. Uh, 
so that uh, there was a, a, a long string of rebellions, uh, lo local rebellions and civil wars being fought in these countries, uh, which plays a major role in the um, in the outbreak of the uh, the War of the Triple Alliance itself. Uh, but yeah, uh, these countries are struggling to uh, um, become more unified and modernized. And uh, there's a racial element to that. The, uh, the elite of uh, the countries of um, most of South America, Brazil, Argentina in particular, they, um, they, they saw uh, modernity and civilization at, in terms of, um, to put it bluntly, white people. And yes. so they, they sought to encourage immigration to their countries uh, from Europe mainly, uh, right. so that you have a fair, a large number of, uh, again, is another aspect of the war. Uh, the armies of Argentina and Brazil contain uh, considerable numbers of German and Italian immigrants in their ranks. Um, so these, the, those are some of the aspects of uh, South America um, in the in the decades leading up to the war. Fascinating, fascinating. fascinating. Would you say also um, the events? Because I know chronologically, this also is several years after Simon Bolivar's uh, revolution with Colombia against Spain. Do you think that also may have possibly contributed in some shape or form to 1860s and the 1870s for Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay? Most certainly. Um, Brazil is kind of um, uh, uh, an outlier. Um, there was certainly, and I'll get that out of the way first, there was certainly a uh, revolt for independence. However, uh, it was it was kind of a strange situation. It goes back to, and I don't want to go too far back, but it goes yeah. back to uh, the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon invades uh, Portugal, mm -hmm. and the Portuguese royal family decides that it's uh, it needs to escape. Uh, the British provide uh, ships to transport the entire Portuguese court, which was thousands of people, uh, to Rio de Janeiro. Okay? They show up without warning. <laughs> you can imagine what the people in Rio de Janeiro must have thought when, the, when their, their king and queen and their whole court show up you know, without any kind of warning. They set themselves up in Rio de Janeiro uh, and Frankly, they began to quite like it. They they uh, they enjoyed uh, um, living in Rio de Janeiro. It was a little difficult convincing them to go back to Portugal. Uh, they didn't go back until a number of years after uh, Waterloo. Um, and um, what happened was they were forced to return to Portugal because of political issues back in Portugal. Mm. Uh, conflicts between liberals and conservatives. And right. so they left their son there, Pedro, uh, who was, you know, a, a prince of the, uh, you know, of, of the royal family of Portugal uh, to rule. Uh, and oh, and port, uh, while they were there, Brazil was declared a kingdom. So there were like two kingdoms. Uh, and ultimately, and perhaps inevitably, uh, Pedro chose uh, to break the link and to become independent of Portugal and set up his own monarchy so that he became Pedro the first emperor of Brazil. Um, and that was that's very different from what happens in almost the rest of South America, because almost the rest of South America, with the exception of those uh, Guineas, you know, uh, Dutch Guinea, French Guinea, English Guinea, those are the only exceptions. 
um, yeah, all the rest of it is um, part of the Spanish Empire. And uh, due to the efforts of Simon Bolivar, uh, beginning in Venezuela, and uh, San Martin, beginning in Argentina, uh, this, uh, tremend these tremendous wars of liberation are fought, beginning in the 18-teens uh, and ending in the mid-1820s. Um, and so, you know, th this is how the Spanish colonies get their independence. Of course, the difference here is the Spanish monarchy wasn't present in South America like the Portuguese monarchy was. Right. So these places, uh, taking a cue from the United States and France vis-a-vis -vis the French Revolution, declared independent republics. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the problems was that um, was that what what would these republics consist of? Would they simply be uh, the former administrative districts of the Spanish colonies? Okay, the different vice royalties. All right, and right. this is one of the great problems. Uh, and, and again, this is where you get that border problem. You know, because many of these borders were just administrative uh, uh, um, borders. They weren't even uh, borders separating Spanish colonies from Portugal, co Portuguese colonies. And those administrative borders were sometimes shifted during their during their history so that one one uh, uh, country would say, well, we we you know, we want this border that was in place in 1763 and another right. country will say no but we want the border that was in place in 1778 you know <laughs> this sort of thing right. so it becomes a major problem the vice royalty uh of uh that that argentina was part of included uruguay and paraguay so that when that part of the spanish empire uh, declared itself an independent republic. The government in Buenos Aires uh, wanted to, uh, well, they they assumed that they still controlled Paraguay and Uruguay because it had been part of the colonial viceroyalty. Right. Okay. Well, the, the Paraguay did not agree with that. Okay. Mm. So this is where an independent Paraguay comes from. Uruguay which is really the, 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 um, the cockpit of this conflict. Um, Uruguay was not only um, something that Buenos Aires had a claim on, but it was also something that, that uh, Brazil claimed. Um, it's a natural Southern border for the Brazilian empire because it's the, um, the Northern coast of the Rio de la Plata estuary. Right. The problem with that is that if Brazil controls that, uh, it will be just a, a short distance away from the capital of Argentina, Buenos Aires, which is on the southern coast of the, you know, estuary. So this is why, you know, uh, that that becomes a problem. OK, um, do you want me to tell you anything more uh, about this or do you want to wait? Um, let's actually wait uh, for the end because we'll probably get to it. So from what yeah. you've been telling mm -hmm. me, it really seems that a lot of contributing factors played into the war of the Triple Alliance. And I love the fascination that you brought up with uh, Portugal and Brazil, because I think when we think of European history in Latin America, Portugal tends to be the one that's kind of omitted. We know about France, we know about Spain, we know about Great Britain, mm -hmm. but no one really takes into consideration of Portugal. Portugal has kind of always been the, the off brother of the mm -hmm. Iberian family. But it is mm -hmm. interesting to know that not only did they flee to Brazil during the Napoleonic era, the son cut all ties with his own family to establish his own monarchy. And mm -hmm. then... Around that same time, you had Simon Bolivar, who was establishing his own uh, revolution in mm -hmm. Venezuela, and of course, revolutionaries in Argentina that greatly uh, destabilized the Spanish control there, which 
Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Topic to discuss. But then that leads into, as you said, another issue. What's actually the defined regions of Venezuela, of Argentina, of Colombia? Brazil mm -hmm. has an idea of where it is because it's like the, the largest uh, politically and geographically. And yeah, more so. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Paraguay is sort of like this buffer zone for all these powerful uh, regions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, I can imagine the leaders in Paraguay discussing amongst themselves, we got to do something. If we don't do anything, we're either going to be part of Argentina, we're going to be part of Brazil, we need to do something. So that then leads us to another discussion, which um, you can probably talk us more about, which were the military leaders. And from the article that you sent me, there was one leader in uh, Paraguay who some scholars say was the Napoleon um, of that uh, <laughs> time period. I think he thought that. <laughs> <laughs> well, who was this man and what ultimately was his role in the war? Well, he started the war, frankly. Um, he's an interesting guy. Uh, uh, Francisco Solano Lopez was his name. Uh, and he is the third of uh, three uh, leaders of independent Paraguay. Okay. Ah. Uh, the first was Dr. Francia, who I'm not sure if he took religious orders or not. <clears throat> he did get a Jesuit education. I know that. Um, and Francia, who founded Paraguay as an independent state. Uh, and I don't want to get off the subject of Lopez, but just, just <laughs> for a second to say about him, uh, Francia, uh, he is... He is really a remarkable guy. Uh, he he was a, he was a, an ascetic. He lived like a monk. He never did anything for his own enrichment. Everything he did, I, I he certainly believed in his own mind. Everything he did, he did for the country of Paraguay. Okay. He actually uh, um, enforced a law. This is this is one of the most this is, I think, one of the most radical uh, 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 social experiments uh, I've, I've, I've ever heard of. Uh, he actually enforced a law that any uh, Caucasians, any descendants of Spanish settlers who, of course, were in the minority, uh, were not allowed to marry each other. They had to marry a Guarani Indian or a mestizo, a mixed Indian, you know, European descent. So right. in other words, he wanted to eliminate the the um, the division, the racial division, right. uh, which which formed the social and economic hierarchy of these societies. None of the other countries do this, of course, uh, but he does this. So and in doing so, he makes Paraguay far more racially homogenous than any other country in, in South America. Um, so moving on from him, uh, Lopez's father, whose name I can't recall right now, takes over. Uh, now he, uh, and all three of these fellas, uh, whatever their title is, Lopez's title is president uh, for 10 years or something, president, ignore that. They're dictators, okay? It's, there's no two ways about it, you know? Right. Uh, benevolent or otherwise. Um, but uh, um, Lopez's father, he uh, tries to do a great deal of good for Paraguay. Uh, but unlike Francia, and by the way, I don't think, I don't think Francia ever married, so I don't think he had a family. Uh, okay. Unlike Francia, uh, Lopez's father uh, made sure to enrich his family while he was trying to do whatever good he was trying to do for uh, Paraguay. Uh, he's the one that introduces a lot of the modernization. And he puts his son in charge of the army, okay, at the, at the tender age of 18. Wow. 
and yes, and Lopez is uh, uh, bundled off to Europe on a uh, diplomatic mission uh, in which uh, he's there to, um, to, to purchase technology, uh, modern ships, uh, 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 telegraph, railroad technology, weapons, a lot of weapons. Uh, and indeed, uh, m pretty much all the modernization that's introduced in the Paraguay by Lopez's father it is principally aimed at strengthening Paraguay's military uh, power. Okay, even though it, even if it has a civilian use, nevertheless, it you know, for instance, he sets up foundries to be able to cast their own cannons. He sets up uh, facilities to manufacture their own uh, 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 firearms. Okay, right. Hand, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, muskets. Uh, anyway, Lopez goes to Europe. He visits England, France, and Sardinia. And uh, a number of very important things happen in France while he's over there. One is he falls in love with the, uh, the, the uh, uh, memory of Napoleon I and becomes a very, uh, and he, he becomes a great admirer of the, uh, the present day reigning Napoleon III, Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, uh, nephew, Louis Napoleon. Um, and uh, he just, he is just bowled over by all the pomp and circumstance of French military power. Uh, he actually attends courses at St. Cyr, the uh, French uh, uh, West Point. Um, that's, that's one thing. And of course, all this time he is purchasing weapons and he is hiring European specialists, technicians to come back to Paraguay to set up these industries uh, and to, to instruct Paraguayans in, uh, you know, all this new technology and this sort of thing. And right. many of these people that are uh, contracted from, from England, uh, uh, from uh, mainly from England, although there are others, uh, end up staying on during the war and become very important in the war effort. The other major thing that happens with Lopez when he goes to France is he meets um, this woman, Eliza Lynch. Eliza Lynch was an Irishman, you know, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> and uh, Eliza Lynch, God bless her, she was uh, basically a gold digger. Uh, she had married a French military veterinarian, uh, and then only after the marriage, I suppose, she discovered that this is not a really lucrative position in life, and so she left him, and she met Lopez, and, um, well, Lopez was struck, you know, by, by Cupid's arrow, and he fell desperately in love with uh, Eliza, and so he brought her back home as his mistress. Now, I think if he, if I remember, I think he had seven children with her. However, okay, uh, all these folks, Irish, Paraguayan, uh, you know, they're all Catholic. So Eliza is still married to this French military veterinarian. So um, um, Lopez never actually marries her. Okay, he ne she, they're never actually married. Nevertheless, she is the, the basically the uncrowned queen of Paraguay. She introduces a lot of uh, social graces, you know, a lot of the, the latest French fashions, uh, right. you know, she, she throws parties for the upper crust and this, and Lopez, members of Lopez's family who did not necessarily like her. They weren't crazy about this. Uh, maybe they saw better than Lopez that she was a, a gold digger. But at any rate, um, Lopez uh, takes over when his father dies, which isn't too long, too much longer after he returns from France. And well, Lopez, uh, I think he was surrounded by psychophants. And that's never healthy because, you know, that tends to inflate the ego. Uh, and I don't think he had any trouble inflating his own ego. 
Right. Uh, yes, I, I think that title, Napoleon of, 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 of South America, I think he would approve of that. Uh, but but his, his uh, actual performance leaves a great deal to be desired. It was not a Napo he was not a Napoleon by any stretch of imagination outside of his imagination. Right. So um, and he one of the factors um, that contribute to the war uh, is his own ambitions to emulate Napoleon. OK, mm -hmm. he wants to be uh, a, a, a great military leader. Unfortunately, you can't really be a great military leader unless you're in a war. Peacetime, right. you generally don't get that. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, he was certainly primed and ready for uh, aggressive action. And um, yeah, and so so that's Lopez. And, and he, oh, and and he. Um, well, this is the this is the problem. Okay, his <laughs> reputation in Paraguay was resurrected, uh, and now he's a national hero. Okay, um, objectively, objectively, uh, Francisco Solano Lopez, and I apologize to any Paraguayans who are watching this and, and are offended. <laughs> I don't mean to offend you, but I, I call, I, as a historian, you have to call them as you see them. And objectively, uh, Francisco Solano Lopez was a monster. Uh, he, he was the author of his country's utter destruction. Mm. Um, he could have stopped it. He started it and he could have stopped it. And not only that, but he continued it uh, to an extent that, 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 that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, he, he became paranoid and had some of his closest advisors execute it. He actually uh, issued an execution order for his own mother. Oh, uh, yes, um, he was killed before uh, his mother, the execution of his mother was carried out. Um, he, he always made sure that he was already, he was always taken care of. He never missed a meal at a time when uh, the remnants of the Paraguayan population were were uh, uh, beyond famished. They were they were suffering horrible starvation. So, you know, he he was a. Uh, in my humble opinion, he was a curse on the country. You mm. know, just as much the same way as a curse was Hitler was a curse to Germany. You know, right. because he basically does the same thing. He brings upon utter destruction upon his country. Uh, out of his own uh, um, uh, uh, um, unrealistic, aggressive actions, you know. Right. It, it, it is very fascinating. And I like that you brought the two big points um, when talking about Latin American history. Number one was, of course, the, the, the caste system that was in Latin America. You had America. those who were um, very fair skinned of European descent those who were mixed with the uh, indigenous people and those who were mixed with the African slave. That was a huge racial hierarchy in mm -hmm. Latin America that a lot of people really don't take consideration when discussing Latin American history. And the second thing that I'm glad you brought up was, of course, um, the imports of foreign weapons, foreign ideas. And when looking up at Latin America, I actually have a previous guest um, earlier this year who talked about the role of the Confederate Navy post-Civil War and a lot of mm -hmm. Confederate soldiers fled mm -hmm. to South America because they could find work as advisors mm -hmm. and sometimes generals mm -hmm. in Latin American armies. So it is very fascinating to see that different strands of history connect. And as you mentioned before, with Lopez being a plight on his own people. 
I can imagine his enemies took this opportunity and realized we can actually beat um, this individual. Because what was the ultimate goal for the Triple Alliance? I mean, geographically, Paraguay is significantly smaller. They're probably not a lot of manpower um, they could uh, produce. And from my own individual research, I think Paraguay was able to muster like 200,000 soldiers where the combined armies of Argentina, uh, the Kingdom of Brazil, and their other ally were able to probably match, if not double it. And it kind of seemed like oh, yeah. overkill in a way. So yeah. why did all these three nations band together when one would argue something like someone like Argentina or Brazil could easily take out uh, Paraguay? Was it mainly to ensure that one country did not take um, Paraguay to add it to their own um, region? Well, I mean, you know, it's it, 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 I'm teaching a course on World War II right now, and, you know, you might ask, well, why did the Allies band together? Well, because Hitler attacked each one of them. <laughs> um, and that's precisely, well, that's more or less precisely, certainly true of Argentina and Brazil. Um, to, to explain all this, I have to go back to the, the Uruguay and just, just a very short thing. Uh, Uruguay um, was created out of a war between Brazil and Argentina in the 1820s. Okay. Mm, okay. The British negotiated a peace treaty, and because two countries can't control the same territory at the same time, okay, the British compromise was we're going to set up this country, Uruguay, as an independent country to serve as a buffer state. Okay, it's kind of like Belgium, you know. Um, now the problem was that just because um Argentina could no longer, or, or Brazil could no longer actually possess Uruguay, <laughs> it certainly didn't mean that they weren't going to interfere with Uruguay. So that the two main political factions in Uruguay, the, uh, the, the, the Blancos, the whites, and the Rojos, the reds, uh, generally Brazil would support one, and Argentina would support the other with money and arms and this sort of thing. Oh boy. And, and there would be a perpetual civil war going on in Uruguay. Well, uh, just before the War of the Triple Alliance, uh, once again, there's civil war. The Blancos are the quote unquote legitimate government. Oh, well, and I, don't, I guess I shouldn't put quote unquote there. They're the, they're the government. OK, the Blancos are in control and the Rojos are the rebels under this leader named Flores. And for uh, for reasons that I'm not I don't quite remember and are not really necessary to know right now. Uh, oddly enough, Argentina and Brazil found themselves both supporting the Rojos against the Blancos. Yes, Ooh. this was a very unusual situation. Um, now, uh, Paraguay, um, to one degree or another, recognized that the hostility between Argentina and Brazil was a good thing for them because it kind of counterbalanced out those two powers against one right. another, okay? For instance, if Argentina actually invades uh, uh, Paraguay, uh, Paraguay would probably be able to get Brazil to help them. If if Brazil arch, uh, you know, uh, invades Paraguay, Argentina will probably probably be able to come in and help Paraguay right. because neither one wants the other to possess it, you know, in its entirety. Um, but the potential for uh, Argentina and Brazil to be on the same side in this Uruguayan uh, civil war was seen as a threat. Um, and so um, Lopez decides uh, to back the Blancos against mm. the Rojos. All right. Um, it has no actual impact on the civil war uh, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, 
um, <clears throat> when uh, Lopez uh, goes to war, uh, he seizes a ship on the Paraguay River uh, that is transporting the new governor for uh, uh, the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso. Uh, the Paraguayan River is the only way to get there. <laughs> yeah, it's in the it's too far away, and there are no roads, and you know, so the only <clears throat> the only way to get your governor there for the Brazilian government is to send him on a ship that actually goes through Paraguay. Okay, and that was supposed to be okay. There wasn't supposed to be any problem with that. Uh, but Lopez decided to go to war with Brazil without any provocation. He seizes the ship and the governor. And then the first thing he does, the first thing he does, uh, does he go south to help the Blancos in Uruguay? No, no, he doesn't do that at all. He's supposed to be helping them. What does he do? He goes north. And he invades disputed territory between Paraguay and Brazil in Mato Grosso. Okay. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, you know, people who argue about the Triple Alliance being just in it to, you know, get disputed territory. You know, the fact is that, you know, Lopez uh, actually crossed that line himself first before anything else happened. Well, meanwhile, because the Blancos are getting, well, I don't even know if the Paraguayans would be able to change the course of the Civil War in Uruguay anyway, even if they had. Because, and, and another problem for the Paraguayans is that there is Argentine territory between Uruguay and Paraguay. So in order to take his forces to help the Blancos in Uruguay, Lopez would have to cross uh, uh, Argentine territory. And indeed, that's the next step he takes. He asked uh, the president of Argentina, Bartolomeo Mitre, uh, he asked him, oh, pardon me, can I take my army across your territory to get to Uruguay to help, you know, your enemies in Uruguay? Well, the answer was going to be obvious, right? Right. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, you're fighting a war against the Blancos. Do you mind if I take my army across your territory so I can help the Blancos against the faction that you're backing? No, he says. OK, so what does Lopez do? He's already at war with Brazil. OK, so he invades this territory of Argentina and brings Argentina into the war by, by an, an unprovoked invasion of Argentina. OK. Uh, meanwhile, the Blancos are defeated. Flores, the commander of the Rojos, uh, becomes the undisputed leader of Uruguay. And so now that Brazil and Argentina are um, at war with Paraguay, uh, the, the, the three countries, Argentina, Brazil, and now the, you know, Flores, who is an ally of both countries, having been backed by them against the Blancos, they sit down and they sign, sign the Treaty of uh, the Triple Alliance, um, which um, is leaked. I think it's by a British newspaper at one point because it's a secret treaty. And essentially, part of the treaty says that Argentina and Brazil uh, are going to um, resolve their uh, territorial disputes with Paraguay in their, in their favor. OK, so, you know, yeah, they are going to you, the, you can argue they're taking advantage of um, this war uh, to, you know, take territory away from Paraguay for their own sake. But let's face it. Why are they at war with Paraguay in the first place? Because they were attacked by Paraguay. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just. It, you know, it, it, you're just bringing all this grief on yourself. Now, before you say, you know, Lopez must have been out of his mind to go to war with Argentina and Brazil at the same time, both countries being much larger and much more powerful than Paraguay alone. Um, in the decades before this, uh, both countries had uh, suffered a great deal of instability with a right. great many rebellions and things like this. And that's what Lopez was banking on, 
Okay. He was banking on uh, instability, rebellion within both Brazil and Argentina, uh, uh, preventing those countries from being able to effectively wage a war against Paraguay. Okay. Mm. Um, unfortunately for Lopez, that didn't come about. Nope. That simply didn't come about. Yes. And, um, you know, but this is how the Triple Alliance is formed. Okay. Right. Brazil and Argentina are both attacked by Paraguay. And both Brazil and Argentina uh, have put Flores into power in Uruguay. So in return, Flores is kind of obligated to side with Brazil and Argentina against right. Paraguay. After all, Paraguay was supposedly backing Flores' enemies, the Blancos, right? So, um, yeah, so that's how these three guys, the, these three countries end up. And it, it's fascinating because, you know, very often, uh, letters, diaries, things like that from uh, the uh, troops uh, in the Allied Army, uh, the Argentines very often will be writing home, and, you know, writing in their diary, you know, what are we doing here fighting alongside the, these Brazilians? We should be fighting them, not fighting alongside them, you know. They're our mortal enemy or what have you, you know. And, uh, and that... You know, the alliance, like any alliance in history, was not always smooth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, by the last years of the war, it was really just Brazil fighting the war. Yeah, it was really because um, the, the, the contribution of Uruguay was more or less a token contribution. It was, it was, a, very, it was a relatively small uh, right. force. They fought very well. And they certainly suffered plenty of casualties, but it was a relatively small force. The two big contributors, of course, were Brazil and Argentina. And uh, Argentina, more than Brazil, grew increasingly uh, disenchanted with the war. And uh, the Argentine people's support for the war uh, declined significantly. And, and, uh, later, not not right at the beginning, but later on, there were rebellions in the uh, rural districts of Argentina against the government in Buenos Aires. So that was another issue, not to mention the uh, the difficulties that Argentina had from the um, from the Native Americans, uh, you know, because what, what we see in the map in, of Argentina today, uh, only the northern third was actually under the control of the government. The rest of it was uh, was Native American territory. So anyway, so yeah, that that's how the Triple Alliance was formed and why it was formed. Okay. Well, we're almost seeing the end of our discussion. So I guess a very another important question, Paul. So we talked about the, the war. We talked about that it went longer than it should have been. A lot of lives were lost on both sides. Brazil was pretty much the one who kind of ended up like the pseudo victor um, in the end. And ultimately, uh, Paul, why should people care about uh, this war? What is the significance? I know we talked about this before, but why is this war important now? Why is it important now? And what can we learn from it in the modern times? Well, I guess some people could argue it isn't important now, is it? But I don't know. Um, it certainly shaped Brazil in a significant way. And Brazil today is a rising power. Right. So to understand Brazil, any country, you have to understand its history. And that was an important chapter in its history. Um, it was also an important chapter in the history of Argentina to one degree or another. Um, it certainly was a, a huge turning point, tragically, for Paraguay. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, I, I have taken it upon myself to try to encourage people to be interested in the history of Latin America. It, it, it's, it's, it's very much... Um, it's very, it's generally very much ignored 
uh, in, in many history, uh, uh, his general history books, usually, I mean, I, I imagine you can relate to this. You know, when, when you and I went to high school and college, you know, the courses that we took, you, you would hear about, okay, there's the conquistadors. Right. Uh, yeah. And then you might hear a little bit about this guy, Simon Bolivar and, and, and yes. maybe San Martin. And of course, as an, as a as a, a person from the United States, you would hear about the U.S. Mexican War. Mm -hmm. That was it. That's about it, you know. And, and uh, yeah, and it's unfortunate. I mean, after all, you know, we're a globe. This, you know, I, I you know, this may be kind of a, a, a trope or something, but you know, we are far more global than we ever have before. Have have been before. OK. And, you know, I, I don't know if you found this. I certainly have found this uh, in my travels and, and here in the United States, when I talk to people who aren't from the United States originally, like me, um, that if you know a little bit about their country's history, it makes a big difference. Yes. You know, because... Uh, it's it's a very I find it very very strange um, that uh, Americans uh, and that by the way that's a that's a bad uh, 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 term really because Americans who are Americans well Canadians are Americans Brazilians are Americans they're all part of the Americas and they'll tell you that mm -hmm. um, so people I I should be more specific people in the United States are very proud of their country. And and that's that's perfectly fine. That's 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 only you know that's right to be proud of of your country, the good things that your country has done. Uh, and yet, oddly enough, the same people that are proud of the United States don't seem to appreciate that other people can be proud of their countries. You know, especially if they're from you know countries that aren't superpowers or even even major powers you know and and so um you know the, the under to to appreciate that it's important to appreciate that that other people people from every country around the globe you know um have a certain pride certain amount of pride for where they come from right and again knowing about knowing a little bit about where they come from um, is a, a great way to um, establish a relationship with a, a person, you know, to, to, to reveal to that person that, yeah, I may, I'm from the United States, but actually, yeah, I do know about Ecuador. I do know about Argentina or Nigeria or um, Sweden or, you know, Bhutan or, you, you know, you name it, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and it's part of the human story, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, you know, and, 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 and this is, this is one of the things that, um, that, that I, I find particularly interesting is the different parallels that you can draw between the war of the Triple Alliance, AKA the Paraguayan War and the U.S. Civil War. Uh, there's a lot of parallels there. And it's and it's already there already been have a, a, a couple of authors have written books about um, this fact to one degree or another. One author has, has written a book comparing uh, the end of slavery in the United States with the end of slavery in, in uh, Brazil. Right. Um, and uh, I think it, it it's it's interesting. It's part in a way <clears throat> it's part of the international dimension of uh, the great, terrible, tra tragic uh, struggle that took place in, in the United States between 1861 and 65, mm -hmm. um, and, and the connections it has. You mentioned, for instance, uh, Confederate, you know, former Confederate officers finding employment elsewhere, you know? Right. And that's a fascinating uh, subject. Um, there was a Confederate naval officer who became an admiral in the Peruvian Navy. There's actually a book about him. Mm -hmm. um, there was actually a, 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 not a big, a, a, a modest little a Confederate 
uh, colony in Brazil. There were, there were, yeah, they set themselves up in the Brazil. So now why Brazil? Can you guess why Brazil? Any guesses? Lay population? Hmm. Brazil was the only country left in the Americas that still had slavery. Mm, you know? That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's, there's other things like that. Um, there's a wonderful book um that i have i happen to have a copy of it's called uh the blue and the gray on the nile uh the ruler of egypt uh wanted to modernize the egyptian army and he um enlisted the help of uh, a, a a number of former union and confederate officers you know to yes that's right <laughs> So it's funny how, you know, these people, you know, that this, uh, oh, and the, the one, there actually are, and I included this uh, with one of the articles I sent, it's just a little snippet from uh, the now, uh, sadly, now defunct magazine, North and South, that was a very good magazine about the Civil War, uh, a little snippet about um uh, U.S. Civil War veterans fighting in the war, the, the Triple Alliance. There was at least two of them. Uh, there was a Polish immigrant. He was sort of a, a soldier of fortune. And uh, he fought uh, on the side of Triple Alliance. And I think he may have had something to do with the introduction of a balloon corps, the first in South America to the Brazilian army, which they used uh for reconnaissance during the war and it was a, it was a, a considerable help because the area that they're the one of the main areas they were fighting it was um poorly mapped terrible terrain and not very not not very familiar so they needed to to draw up maps and to know where you know, everything was you know geographically and the other fella uh was a um confederate a uh, former Confederate officer who was a specialist with uh, what they called back then torpedoes. We call them naval mines today. Mm -hmm. And he helped design those. Um, unfortunately, like so many people in, um, uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, um, among Lopez's uh, um, uh, advisors, he ended up uh, up against the wall, executed um but yeah so yeah it's it's so there's a connection there it's part of the history of the americas you know uh, you right. you can look yeah you can look at you know not just the history of the united states but history of the united states as part of this western hemisphere um and i don't want to go too much farther but uh, for instance one um one thing that is uh, a common feature throughout the Americas, different parts of the Americas, ba you know, uh, um, based on climate and terrain, is um, the cowboy. Uh, there are cowboy cultures in Canada, needless to say, in the southwest of the United States, and that was in exported, by the way, to Hawaii. So there's a cowboy culture in Hawaii. But there, but the cowboy culture in the U U.S. and the Southwest, of course, has its origins in the Spanish colonial caballeros and vaqueros, yes. you know. And then you go down to um, Chile has a cowboy culture. Venezuela has a cowboy culture. Uh, they played a very important role in the armies of Simon Bolivar. These these. Uh, um, these uh, uh, you know cowboys, as it were, just in the same way that the uh, gauchos and gauchos of the mm -hmm. pampas uh, in uh, Argentina and Uruguay and uh, the southernmost state of Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul, all that was uh, you know cowboy culture uh, by any other name, and so this is this is a thing that is common throughout the Americas. It originates in Spain, pretty much, you know, right. and, and but yeah, so the war is part, not just part of the history of South America, it's part of the history of the Americas, the same way that the U.S. Civil War is not just a part of the history of the United States, but it's a history, a part of the Americas, you know, 
So yeah. yeah, so those are some good reasons, I suppose, to uh, to learn about it. Aside and aside from the simple fact that I think it's really fascinating. Awesome, awesome. Well, listeners, we'll have to conclude today's wonderful discussion. I want to thank our guest Paul for joining us and providing his insight on the Warrior Triple Alliance. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. And before you're more we than welcome. Today, uh, in today's session, um, do you have any upcoming products you would like to share? Uh, up, upcoming projects, did you say? Yes. Any magazine articles coming out? Any um, panel discussions? Well, yes. There's a couple of things. Um, I don't know. They don't tell me anything. Uh, <laughs> I just send them the articles and, and they appear on my doorstep when my copy arrives. Um, but yeah, uh, I uh, recently submitted uh, an article on um, the Irish Civil War of 1922-23, of which we just had the uh, centennial. Um, well, well, we're st actually we're still in the centennial. Um, to um, the uh, publishers of uh, Strategy and Tactics magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes, it's a I'm commercial a public. It's it's it's. it's it's a war gaming magazine, but it's all, but it's uh, a very good history magazine too. Um, and uh, I'm <clears throat> related to that. Um, I'm uh, working on a book about the uh, the use of armored fighting vehicles in Ireland between 1916, the Easter Rising, and uh, the Civil War, 1923, and everything in between. So those are the things I'm working on right now. So, and once I'm done that, I think I might just go back to Latin America and also um, the Middle Ages. I, 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 I love the Middle Ages. You know, I, I find that a fascinating period in uh, human history. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listeners, if you want to check out uh, Paul Walsh's uh, LinkedIn site to get in contact with him, to learn about his previous works, or if you want to ask him questions about the World Triple Alliance, Irish uh, Civil War, or Medieval Warfare. I will link his profile down below to check him out. Well, listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for your support in this series. It means a lot to me. And again, a big thank you to our guest, Paul, for joining us for November. Thank you. Well, listeners, this has been another episode here on the Historian's Lounge. This has been the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe signing out. Make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what was your favorite part of the discussion. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Okay, that is.